Welcome everyone. I hope you are all well. Um, whenever you get to see this, um, happy Sunday morning, if it is now, if it's not and it's later, hello, hello. So today's talk is about, and I've had a couple of requests, so it's, it's interesting how you guys are, are getting clued up with the whole psychology bit, so well done. Um, very good stuff. Now, I'm going to try, and, and I do quite hesitantly say try, I'm going to try and share my screen, yeah, no, which I don't think it's going to let me do. Um, I was going to try and, and share my screen, which um, I don't think I'm getting much uh, joy. But anyway, all right, yeah, it's not going to happen, uh, which is such a shame. All right, well, today is about ego states. And like I said, I've had a couple of people asking me um, as to whether I could talk a bit more about them in detail. And of course, I would love to. Um, these are the things that I am extremely passionate about. And so talking about them can only but make me smile. I hope you are all well. Please do say hello. Not that I can see the comments anyway. Um, I've kind of lost access to those two so it's a bit of a strange one today um but anyway we'll go with it so what are ego states well let's start with why understanding ego states is so important because actually let's start there and then work through what they are now ego states are basically and i've talked about this really briefly in past uh, uh chats over the over the months but now I'm going to give you a little bit more of a detailed sort of update on them. So ego states are basically a state of mind, which means you are in one 24 hours a day, right? Unless you're sleeping. And even then, technically, you're still in a state of mind. But ego states are about our states of mind. And we are in one of those all of the time. Now, imagine your state of mind and the one that you're in is actually what's playing the biggest part on the feelings that you're feeling, which are then playing the greatest part on your behavior. So if you are unhappy with a behavior, then you need to start going back to the root cause to understanding well, what's going on in my internal environment. Ego states is a great way to, to make tangible yeah, something that's not so tangible. So it's making the intangible tangible, right? And this is using ego states. So in order for you to really start to understand basically what character you move into, uh, what triggers that character, how and why, gives you then the ability to manage your relationship with food. Genius, isn't it? I know. So in order to understand your internal environment, you want to then be able to use different tools and resources. And ego states is one of them. OK, there are plenty of tools and resources out there, um, you know, like CBT. CBT is fantastic. And I'll talk about that actually next uh, the next chat that I do, because CBT is great too. CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, it can be seen as quite a basic therapy. It's not, but it has to be used in conjunction with other stuff. So this is where we kind of get it wrong. Right. But with ego states, what you want to understand is, number one, what are ego states? So. First off, we know that ego states are a state of mind, but we need to understand what they fall under. And they fall under something called transactional analysis, which is TA, right? So that's actually the umbrella that ego states fall under. So when we go TA, sorry, my kind of computer is doing some very funny things today. My apologies. Um, so when we talk about TA, transaction analysis, under that umbrella falls ego states. Transactional analysis is what? It's pretty much what it says on the tin, right? It's analyzing transactions. But what we have to understand is a transaction is not just what's happening outside of you. A transaction is also what's happening inside of you. Yeah, we are transacting with ourselves and others all of the time because you're thinking, especially today's day and age, you're thinking pretty much all of the time and thinking means there's a dialogue and a dialogue is a transaction so imagine that you're transacting either with yourself or others 24 hours a day that's too much and not just that you don't even know what's being said but that's a problem isn't it right and it really is a problem why because it's impacting how you feel 
and how you feel, whether you like it or not, is impacting how you are behaving. Well, if you want to change your behavior, you've got to go to the root. Yeah, and that is the root. It is actually bringing into awareness what the hell is going on in my internal environment. What happens outside of you, would you believe, is actually secondary, secondary to what's happening inside of you. And the reason for that is that if you can manage your internal environment, right, your thoughts and your feelings, if you can learn to not only bring them into awareness, but if you can learn to manage those, then automatically you will be able to manage your behaviors. So when someone says, oh, I wish that I could do more exercise, well, then that behavior can automatically be addressed by bringing into awareness your internal environment. Genius, I know. So your internal environment, transactions, all of these are key to you managing your relationship, not just with food, but with exercise and with others and yourself in a better, a healthier way, right? So transactions are inside, transactions are outside. A transaction also is a smile. If I smile at you, that's a transaction. It will impact you in one way or another. You may look and go, oh, and smile back. You may just automatically smile at me, or you might think, that one's a bit doolally. Whichever one it is, it's a transaction, isn't it? Because it's impacting you. Right. If I look at you and I go, with one of my eyebrows raised, that's going to impact you, isn't it? And that's a transaction. You see, I didn't have to say anything. But yet me looking at you with a raised eyebrow has pretty much done it. Right. Sorry, my doing some very funny things today. I really am sorry. I'm going to be stopping and starting, just trying to figure out what's going on here. I hope that you guys can see me. Oh, look, some comments have popped up. Hello, Amanda. Hello, Belinda. Hi, Denise. And hi, Angela. Lovely, lovely, lovely to hear from you guys. Um, sorry, my comments are a bit bit funky today too. But so those are transactions. Sorry, you know, I think I've got ADHD, uh, you know, kind of fly off and just see a bird and I'm off like a bird in the sky, but, uh, but okay, so where were we? My, ap my apologies. Uh, right, so transactional analysis, a transaction is a smile, a transaction is a raise of an eyebrow. I mean, how does that make you feel? A transaction is just this. Imagine if I say nothing and just look at you and go, how does that make you feel? You see, these are all transactions. People think it's about what we say to each other. No, not at all. They are also about exchanges of body language. They are also about exchanges of energy. I am a big ball of energy, a pretty big ball of energy. I am a trillion times a trillion atoms vibrating. I am energy. You are also energy, whether you like to admit it or not, you are also energy. Now, as we are all energy, we are able to feel each other's energies. Of course you are, yeah? And when you do that, you're giving off something and we are then feeling each other. Now, again, these are transactions and these are elements that are impacting us 24 hours a day, all of the time. So what you wanna do is start to become aware of it, hence transactional analysis, hence ego states. So swiftly moving on, uh, transaction analysis falls under uh, the umbrella of transaction analysis. Ego states falls under that. And ego states are what? Now, I am a little bit miffed because I had this fantastic full screen ad tools. I don't know. Maybe just if you could bear with me, right? Just because I've got this brilliant, brilliant PowerPoint thing that I wanted to show you. Because if I just talk about it, it's going to be a little bit difficult for you to visualize. So what I was hoping to be able to do was to show it to you, which I obviously can't. Um, so, yeah. All right. Well, I'll just have to kind of draw it now. Yeah? I'll do that. I can't even print it, unfortunately, because my printer is uh, under stuff. But I'm going to draw it. Don't say that I don't try my best for you, ladies. Look, so we've got ego states and what we have is three basic ego states. And that's what you really want to start to understand is you have three basic ego states. 
looks like a snowman, but we're going to give it a go. Yeah. And they look like, ta -da! they look like this. There we go. What do you see? You see it? Yeah. Here you go, Sage. You've got P up top. You've got A in the middle and you've got C down below. Now, what are they? P is for parent. A is for adult. And C is for child. And they are in that order for a specific reason. The parent is at the top, the adult is in the middle, and the child is at the bottom. Now, what you want to understand about ego states is you will only fall into a particular state of mind if you were that way when you were growing up or someone outside of you behaved that way when you were growing up. Yeah, you cannot move into a state of mind if you've never experienced it. Yeah. And again, I'll give you examples of that in a minute. But so. These are your three ego states. And what you're going to do now is you're going to get to know them because you want to start figuring out which ones you move into. Yeah, especially when you go for that freezer and that ice cream, you're going to figure it out. So these are your three ego states. Now, these are split up right into an additional five other states of mind. So you have critical parent, nurturing parent, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, sorry, I didn't account for this, you know, I really did think that my screen would be able to share. So unfortunately, you are stuck with my dodgy drawings. We've got rebellious child, we've got free child, and we've got adapted child. So it looks like this. Yeah, you see that? All right. Yeah. As you can see, the parent is split up into two. CP being critical parent. NP being nurturing parent. So that's the parent state of mind. Like I said, in the middle, you have adult. And then at the bottom, you've got the child, which is split into three states of mind. And they are rebellious child there to the top right. Top left is free child. And as you can see, middle bottom, adapted child. Yeah, these are your three child states of mind. Now, the position of these particular states is really important. Why? Because the parent is authority, the adult is middle, and the child is in a position of basically no authority whatsoever, right? And that's why they're down at the bottom. Now, when it comes to ego states, why is it so important? It's important because when you know what state of mind you're in out of these, yeah, you can start to work with it. So the example I gave you was, you keep going to the freezer, yeah, after dinner at 7.30 or whatever it might be in the evening, and you keep going for that ice cream. OK, so how would we manage that? We're going to use this example according to ego states. Now, out of the parent states of mind, you would have had to have had either a critical parent in your upbringing. So either your mum, dad or your guardians or caregivers, whoever they were, would have had to have been either critical parent or nurturing parent. Yeah or even a nan or a granddad, whoever you were with quite a lot, in order for you to have that state of mind, you can't just develop it from nowhere. So I had a very strong critical parent who is my mum, who's she's not so critical anymore, actually, she's chilled out a lot. So it was my mum. And because of that, it means I naturally automatically also have a very strong critical parent, whether I like it or not, it's there. Yeah, and it will come out. But again, we'll talk about when it comes out and how it comes out. So that's critical parent, nurturing parent. Then again, as children, I have to have been that way for me to have that particular state of mind. Right. So I have to have been either rebellious child, meaning I would have had to have rebelled in my upbringing at some point, meaning argue back incessantly, meaning break the rules and the boundaries and push up against them incessantly. Yeah, it's not just one or two bits because we all do that as teenagers, uh, um, you know, pushing up against boundaries. A rebellious child state of mind, which is not a bad one. It's actually really understandably just like all others. A rebellious child state of mind is actually 
just when we are really not okay uh, and we're doing it on a continuous basis, right? So rebellious child, you've got free child, which is very carefree, yeah? Very easygoing, very like, yeah, it's okay, it's all good. And then we've got adapted child, who's very much about following the rules, yeah? And who is very much about processes, very much about rules, rules that are made to be followed, not broken, um, and all of that kind of stuff. So you're gonna start understanding which authority role do I move into, if any, parent, which parent? Is it nurturing parent or is it critical parent? Do I even notice myself moving into any of these? Or which ch child do I move into? And again, we all have them. It just depends which ones we're more comfortable moving into according to our upbringing. So a critical parent. Now, the next thing you wanna know is how to figure out, yeah, what are the clues, the indicators of each particular ego state? So we have body language, tone of voice, and message. These three things matter the most, okay? Body language, tone of voice, and message. Now, oh, is there problems connecting? Um. I don't know. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll carry on. Hopefully uh, this will go through. So we've got body language, tone of voice, yeah, a message. Now, body language is obviously the language of my body. What is it that I'm doing? Am I pointing my finger? Yeah. Am I looking at you in a grimace? Am I snarling? Are my nostrils flared? Are my eyebrows up or just one of them up? So again, this is part of my body language. My tone of voice is obviously the tone of my voice. Is it soft or is it harsh? Is it loud and directive and a little bit aggressive or is it actually quite calm? Is it balanced or is it yo-yoing or roller coastering up and down? So again, the tone of my voice has a lot to do with the energy that I'm giving to you. So again, it's really really important part of the transactions that we're having, the communications that we're having. And then finally, as you can see at the end, is the message. The last thing out of all of those is the message, which is what am I saying? Now, I can say the same thing to you yeah, in three different ways, and it will mean three different things. And this is the key. If you don't take into account the body language and the tone of voice, the message on its own, you can't really gauge much from it at all. There are many people that can say the same thing. So I can say to you, good morning, and I can say it like that, good morning. Or I can say it like this, good morning. Or I can say it like this, good morning. And you see, I've just given you three completely different energies. And this is what you wanna start to understand. What energies are you even communicating to yourself and transacting with yourself? What are you transacting with others? And what are other people transacting with you? What energy do they give you? And again, start to be really mindful of this because you might think you're going a little bit crazy when someone is talking to you in a particular way. They say to you, but I'm fine. But I haven't got a problem. You obviously have a problem. Oh, Amanda. Yeah, I hope it is. I hope everybody else can can see this. OK, but like I said, I'll carry on. Um, I'm seeing it going in and out of here, too, a little bit. So it could just be me, too. I'm really not sure, um, but we'll figure it out. So, yeah, it's really important that you are aware of what others around you are doing, because somebody with their energy can give you particular feelings and particular energy. But I say to you that, no, actually, I'm fine. And there are three different ways of saying I'm fine, right? I'm fine, or I'm fine, or I'm fine. You see, three completely different ways that mean three completely different things. This is really important for us to understand. So if I wanna know what ego state someone is in, I need to look at the body language, the tone of voice, and the message. Now, what does critical parents sound like in terms of body language, tone of voice, and message. A critical parent is, as per the label, critical, but not critical necessarily aggressive, 
okay they aren't always aggressive you have to understand there is uh, a spectrum yeah we have from diversity we have from one end of the spectrum to the other it can be severe it can be mild so the critical parent at their worst yeah critical parent at the most exaggerated is going to be probably aggressive but critical parent in the middle doesn't necessarily have to be aggressive outright they can be aggressive in energy a critical parent is going to be harsh a critical parent is going to be quite rigid a critical parent is going to be straight up and up front when they're speaking you're not going to get much of a yo-yo from their voice you're going to get straight down straight at you and we're also going to and again it looks like we're having a bit of a problem here not quite sure what that is um, my computer is also bringing if 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 we've got anyone still there if you do pop me a message and let me know that it's okay or let me know if you're having problems um, it could literally be my wi-fi as well unfortunately i'm in a mountain in uh, turkey it can struggle but i'll try and make this a brief so that if this is dropping in and out then you're not having too many of the problems but so critical parent is going to be critical but not necessarily outright they're going to be angry but not necessarily outright aggressive ah thank you lisa um not okay so that means hopefully it's it's not uh, much on my side all right so it's going to be aggressive um and again start to look at the exaggeration of it okay so somebody mildly in critical parent isn't going to be necessarily shouting or screaming i mean a critical parent doesn't need to shout or scream a critical parent just needs to be like this a critical parent can say exactly what it is that they need to say with the right body language looking at you directly in your eyes and telling you that you are not doing very well and that is what a critical parent is going to give you you see i don't need to raise my voice i can just give you quite straight up quite rigid body language and i can be and make myself very very clear and that would be a typical critical parent now a critical parent can also be quite quiet but yet say what they need to say not just with their words but with their energy so if i look at you and i say well that is interesting isn't it you see just those few words and that energy is enough to give you the critical parent energy yeah so what we tend to do with critical parent is we think oh they must be shouty screamy and they must be angry no not at all not at all a critical parent doesn't need to be shouty or screamy it's the energy that that particular state of mind is giving you we've then got the opposite of that which is nurturing parent now remember none of these are good and none of these are bad there is no ego state that is like the best ego state not at all each of these ego states is useful in any particular environment you have to understand that actually about everything it is that you learn there is no good and bad there is no right and wrong there are helpful things in particular circumstances so in an experience something might be helpful in another experience it might not we have to start to understand things from that way because then we won't just pigeonhole it and go well this is good this is bad which means this is right and this is wrong and this i just get rid of well no that's not true because in one country or in one area or in one particular experience of yours this might be okay but in another country or an experience or, or whatever it might be this might not be okay so we've got okay not okay you've got to understand that it is both so when we do that we don't discount anything what we do is we include everything and then go okay well in these circumstances this might be quite helpful but in those circumstances that really isn't same for ego states there are no bad ego states there are no good ego states there are just ego states critical parent can be very very useful in certain circumstances but obviously it can be very very detrimental in others i'll run through those later on okay about how this works today's uh, talk is just about what they are so nurturing parent would be the opposite of of critical parent nurturing parent is the one that speaks melodically you know they've got the soft uh, uh voice they can be very wavy wavy up and down like a melody um and again this is at the extreme they are very much about rescuing and giving and loving and they're very tactile 
tactile. Uh, like I said, they're very soft. Um, they are never harsh. A nurturing parent is never harsh. A nurturing parent is always soft. And because of that, a nurturing parent tends to be passive, but then also passive aggressive, right? So a nurturing parent will probably be the one that's going to be um, to make you feel uh, emotionally guilted. So, you know, in that sense, that's what they would do. Uh, a nurturing parent is going to be the one that's going to go, oh, it's OK, when really it isn't OK. So a nurturing parent will say to you, oh, that sounds like it's awful. Would you like a hug? Well, come here and give me a hug. It would be like that, very soft. Or they would say, it's OK. I spent two hours making this dish for you, but if you really don't want it, I'll just put it in the fridge and you can eat it later. And you can kind of tell that they're a little bit annoyed and a little bit miffed. So that would be nurturing parent. Again, at its extremes. So these are the two parent states of mind. Have you had or can you relate to any one of these two? A critical parent type of figure or a nurturing parent type of figure? Yeah, Nurturing parent being very soft. If you can relate to that, understand if you had that in your upbringing, it means that you will also have that particular state of mind that you're able to move into. Yeah. Some of them are detrimental to you when it comes to your relationship with food. Others are helpful. This is what this is about, is for you to start to work with the ones that are helpful and know that when it comes to your relationship with food and exercise, this one isn't. So we've then got adult. I'm going to leave adult till the end or maybe next week, depending on uh, next session, uh, depending on how far we get. But we've then got rebellious child. Right. So as I said here, you've got the children there. And then you've got the rebellious child there, right? So you've got the rebellious child, the free child, and then right at the bottom there, the adapted child. So the rebellious child is, again, always gets the worst stick, man, for being like the worst one. And it isn't the worst one because there is no such thing as the worst one. Rebellious child is basically an angry kid. Think of a teenager, a teenager who's trying to find their identity, a teenager who's trying to become yeah, become whatever it is that they're supposed to be. A teenager that is trying to uh, impress their friends, uh, uh, make friends and be a part of a group and to feel like they belong. Imagine then you've got a parent telling them that they can't do things, which means they can't belong or they can't impress. They're going to get angry, right? Um, now, what happens is that anger turns into aggression and nobody really sits down and teaches somebody how to work with the anger in a healthy way. So a rebellious child is that, is an angry little dude so a rebellious child is going to be the one that is it's not fair now you can see a critical parent does that but a rebellious child does that it's not fair i can't believe that you're not going to do x y and z for me i can't believe uh, uh you're not going to let me go out i can't believe you're going to ground me that's your typical teenager and that's your typical rebellious child now a rebellious child again body language is like that their tone of voice can and they can come across very similar to critical parents, which is the problem, right? A critical parent and a rebellious child sound very similar. They're not because one's coming from an authority figure. The other one's not. They're coming from a disempowered child place, right? Uh, the last place, which is authority. So rebellious child, you would have had to have rebelled in your upbringing for you to be comfortable in that state of mind. If you did not rebel in your upbringing, then you cannot be comfortable in that state of mind. So once you understand that, you can then start to go, oh, OK, did I or didn't I? Ask yourself, are you comfortable with that personality type? How does it make you feel when you're around rebellious children? Or And remember, a rebellious child, we're saying child, but as an adult, this is the states of mind that we move into. So you're going to have a grown 60 year old individual uh, man or woman, doesn't matter, uh, non-binary, whatever it may be. Um, but you can have a 60 something year old person who can still be in their rebellious child state of mind and they will be acting. They will be behaving exactly as a teenager would, a teenager who is rebelling. So, again, understanding that you can start to ask yourself, do I do it or do others around me? Do they do it? Yeah. And how do I feel around it? So that's rebellious child. We've then got free child. Free child is the easiest one to understand because it's the one that has no real responsibility. It doesn't have the awareness or the understanding of responsibility. It's the one who will turn up late for work and go, oh, whoops. Um, 
you know, I forgot to put my alarm on or my dog ate the homework, you know, it's that kind of thing. The, the free child is also the one that just wants to live a little. The free child is the one that says, come on, man, you only live once. You know, the free child is the one that takes sick days and then goes, oh, man, I don't know how many days I've had off. And they end up in a, a HR for, a, for a, a disciplinary disciplinary interview. So, again, it's like that's your typical free child. Um, and you would have had that if you had grown up with a nurturing parent. You will then naturally be a kind of free child because a nurturing parent is only but creating a free child. So the free child again has body language similar to a nurturing parent there, but they're more excitable. So a, a free child can be quite soft, but yet they can be excitable. Uh, free children are very easygoing. They have no issue whatsoever with going, I don't mind, let's do this, let's do that, let's go with the flow. They don't like rules. They're very bad at rules. They're very bad at following processes. They're very bad at being on time. They're really not very good at these things, but yet they, they're the ones that are going to be the life and soul of your party. They're going to be the ones that um, can pull you out of a miserable place. So if you're feeling a bit down, it's a free child you want to give a call to because they will most certainly cheer you up. They will most certainly bring you out of that. Now, ask yourself, do you have that state of mind? Do you remember behaving that way when you were growing up? Did you have a nurturing parent state of mind in your upbringing? You have to have a nurturing parent in your state, in, in your upbringing to have had a free child state of mind response. So, again, if you didn't have a nurturing parent, it's going to be pretty difficult to say that you have a free child, right? Comfortable in being in free child. It's not that you've got all of these identities bumbling around, but they are states of mind that we move in and out of within milliseconds. And then finally, you've got adapted child. Yeah. Now, the adapted child is exactly as it says on the tin, right? It's the individual who adapts to their particular environment, to wherever it is they are. It's the one that goes along with pretty much anything, but from a very, very, uh, what's the word? From a more vulnerable place, more vulnerable than a free child. So an adapted child is the one that is scared of breaking the rules, and so they won't. An adapted child is the one that's actually scared of getting it wrong. So they'll have to really look at it, work it out, follow a process. The adapted child who is the one who never wants to be late, always has to be on time, or they'd rather be early than be even 60 seconds late. That's the typical adapted child. The adapted child would have had a critical parent in their upbringing. Why? Because a critical parent is what creates an adapted child. Yeah, so that criticism is what then makes a child uh, worry about what the rules are, worry about making sure that they follow them, worry about not being on time or not being good enough or being wrong. So the adapted child is a typical outcome of that. Now, ask yourself, have you had this in your upbringing? Have you been a typical adapted child? An adapted child is going to be can be quite meek. An adapted child is following the rules exactly as they're given. An adapted child isn't usually shouting, no, no, no. An adapted child is doing exactly as they've been asked to do. They're going to be balanced in the way they speak, maybe even quite passive. Uh, they don't want to stand out, so they like to kind of just merge into the background or the group. That's a typical adapted child. Is that something that you can relate to? Ask yourself that. Or is that something or somebody that you grew up with, maybe your siblings? Maybe one of your parents was an adapted child type of figure. And maybe one of your other parents uh, uh, was or is a critical parent. So again, start to look at these. Why is it so important? Because as you learn which ego state you move into more often than not, when it comes to food and exercise, yeah, because each ego state, depending on the environment you're in, can be different. When some of us are in work, we can quite easily move into adult. Yeah, but yet when we are out of work, we find moving into adult very difficult, very difficult. So understand that just because you can be an adult when you're at work, it doesn't mean you can be an adult when you're not in work. So in terms of your relationship with food, let's go back to the scenario of the freezer, right? And the ice cream. So here I am. I have had my dinner. I am chilling out. I don't know, watching something um, on Netflix, of course. 
And all of a sudden, I have a craving for ice cream. What do I do? So the first thing you want to do is start to become aware of what language that is. Who's saying what? What's the what's the energy behind it? What's the message? What's the tone of voice behind that message? And what kind of body language can you feel? If it's rebellious child, you'll know about it because you will be hearing a, a message up there that sounds a bit like, but I want it, but I want it now. Yeah, but it's not fair. I've had a really busy day. I'm allowed to have that. You know what? Actually, I deserve it. I deserve to have that ice cream. And now I want it. And you know what? I am not going to be quiet until you give me my ice cream. And then the next thing you know, it's like you've been possessed. You're walking up to the freezer. You're opening it and you're eating your ice cream. If that's the case, what we want to do is learn to give that particular state of mind what it needs in order for you to then move into a more helpful state of mind. Now, some people, if you have adapted child and you are very good at moving into it, then I tell you what, you won't have a problem anyway. The problem with adapted child is, although you're great at following the rules, adapted child is only able to do a particular thing once. So let's say you're doing this ABFAB program, right? Let's say you've done the ABFAB program and you're like, yay, I've done it from beginning to end. I've met my goals. I am now in the place that I want to be. And I don't know, you then take a break or you move on or whatever it is you're going to do. Now, if, if you did it with a very, very adapted child mentality, what will happen is if you want to come back and do it again. So let's say you've had, I don't know, uh, maybe given birth or maybe some other stuff that may have happened or a transition in your life. You then want to go back to, to eating healthy and back on a program. If you want to do it again, when it comes to adapted child, you can't do it again because the adapted child is made to do stuff once, meaning one program once. When you try to go back onto it again, you find that you just cannot do it. Now, the reason for that is the rules got broken, right? Because when you finished, you came out of that program. And when we come out of that program and we no longer have particular rules that we're following, the ad adapted child no longer has any real kind of power because now the other ego states will kick in. And if you've noticed that, that whenever you do a program, you're able to do it first time brilliantly. And then when you try to go back to something, you can't do it again properly. It's because you've been using adapted child for the first one and the second one. It never works. So, again, we'll talk about that in more detail. And I will be talking about ego states quite a bit uh, coming up because this is really useful when it comes to your uh, relationship with food and exercise. And it's good for you to really start to get comfortable asking yourself, which state of mind am I in? Which state of mind is going to be more useful for me? How can I move into the state of mind that is going to be more helpful for me? And when you start to work at it like that, you're now becoming empowered as opposed to disempowered because you are no longer giving your power away. You're letting yourself know that actually I can manage this and you can. You have the ability to influence your internal environment 100 percent. So why don't you? I mean, really, your external environment will become irrelevant as to what is in and out of it. It won't matter anymore because you have 100 percent influence over your internal environment. That is the key. Nothing else matters, even if someone puts an entire buffet and a, an arraignment of all sorts of stuff in front of you. It really won't matter because what you will have is the ability to be like, I'm OK. I'm actually OK. And when you're OK, no matter what it is that you're trying to do, it will also be OK. So, again, I'm going to leave you with this at the moment because that's a lot of information. And if I hop on about it, I'll lose you. I mean, I've probably lost you already, um, which a couple of people have told me. Um, so, you know, all you want to do is digest that. If you're interested, I've got some videos actually on my YouTube channel. Have a look. Have a think and just keep asking yourself, which state of mind yeah, am I in most of the time? Which state of mind am I in, I don't know, at work? Which state of mind am I in when I am at home with the family? Which state of mind, or just at home on my own, whatever it might be, which state of mind am I in when I'm 
cooking or thinking about cooking? Uh, what kind of language do I hear internally? What does it do to me? What impact does that language have on me? Does it make me want to continue with what I'm doing? Or does it make me want to go, ah, oh, sod it, I can't be asked. What does it make me want to do? When I have my sessions booked in, you know, if I've got one early in the morning, what state of mind do I wake up in? Is it a useful one for me or not? Which one is it? Is it critical parent who says, get out of bed, get out of bed now, because you've got something to do. <clears throat> do I then notice that I rebel and go, actually sod you because I don't want to? I hate you, leave me alone and then go back to sleep. What happens to you? As you start to understand this, you can then start to work with it. So first bring it into awareness and then let the games begin. Because actually when you then know what's going on up there and you start to use the tools to change that state of mind, it really does become quite fun and it becomes really interesting. So thank you very much, ladies, for, for being here. I hope you found that helpful. Um, I am sorry that I couldn't provide you with the PowerPoint. I had a couple of PowerPoint uh, kind of uh, graphics, which would have been helpful because then you would have seen quite a bit of this written down. So, yeah, sorry that you had to follow me along like that. But anyway, I hope you find that useful and stay tuned for the next one, because what we'll do is talk a bit about adult and then really start to work with that. Go away and have a think about which ego states you are surrounded by in your home environment all your friends, your family, whatever they may be, and then which ego states you tend to move in and out of most of the time. Then we can start to work on which ones are unhelpful for you in which particular situations. So lovely to be here. I will see you guys next again in about a month. Take care of yourselves, all of you. Um, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.